Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning into the program today. My name is Alvin, and I am currently an undergraduate student at the University of Pittsburgh. I've been growing carnivorous plants now for most of my life, and I'm so excited today to be presenting to you an introduction to carnivorous plants. We're going to be going over what carnivorous plants are, where they're found, how they work, and how you can even grow some of them for yourself at home. Just before we move on, I'd like to thank the Cooper Siegel Community Library for inviting me today. I'm always so enthusiastic to share this topic with new people. So first, we have to ask ourselves, what actually is a carnivorous plant? And that's a question with surprisingly complex answers, so it might be easier to start with what a carnivorous plant is not. Up on the slide here, I've put a couple of fantastical representations of carnivorous plants in popular media throughout the ages, ranging from the 1800s, the man-eating tree of Madagascar, all the way up to the modern era. This is Audrey III from the Broadway musical Little Shop of Horrors, and down here is a massive Venus flytrap from the movie Journey to the Center of the Earth. From these representations, we can see that carnivorous plants have captivated the public imagination for quite a while now. And I don't think it's too difficult to imagine why. I mean, there's very little that's more exotic than a plant that literally eats meat, except for maybe an actual alien. And a lot of people would go on and say that carnivorous plants are what they think of if they were asked to think of an alien. <laughs> In fact, Carl Linnaeus, the famous 17th century Swedish naturalist who founded the system of modern taxonomy, went on the record and said that to think plants ate insects would go against the order of nature as willed by God. He didn't think that they were actually real. Of course, nowadays we do know that carnivorous plants are real, and in fact, there is over 750 known species of them that grow on every continent except for Antarctica. Unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately, I should say, there are actually no man-eating plants. Um, carnivorous plants are not dangerous to anything larger than a small mammal. But despite the fact that these popular representations are not actually true, I don't think that makes real carnivorous plants any less fascinating or interesting than their fictional counterparts. On most days, the definition of a carnivorous plant is lobbied around the scientific arena like a pinball. But generally, researchers agree that carnivorous plants all have adaptations to attract, trap, kill, digest, and extract nutrition from animal prey. I make a point of saying nutrition here because, as far as we know, no carnivorous plant actually gets energy from their prey. The plants are going after nutrients that are not present in the soil in areas where they grow, such as nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. To do so, carnivorous plants have evolved a stunning array of different adaptations to trap insects. Uh, for example, here we have a sundew found in New Jersey that has trapped an unfortunate dragonfly. And down here is one of my Venus flytraps that has finished digesting its fly dinner and is now proudly displaying the carcass. Of course, all of this is very fascinating and cool, but what's the point of carnivory? If every plant could potentially get nutrition from insects, why haven't all plants evolved the same adaptations? Well, the answer to that lies in where carnivorous plants are specifically found. Carnivorous plants have a cosmopolitan distribution all around the world, and in fact, they're found on every continent except Antarctica. However, the caveat is that they're restricted to very specific niches where the soil is poor in nutrients. That can include habitats like acidic peat bogs, longleaf pine savanna, rocky outcroppings, montane rainforests, mountaintops, sandy river seepages, and more. Outside of these very specific habitats, carnivorous plants are not very competitive with normal plants. That's because the adaptations for carnivory, such as modified leaves and specialized digestive enzyme production, are very energy intensive. So in areas where there's enough nutrients in the soil, more insect prey is not necessary to supplement a plant's growth, being carnivorous is actually a significant disadvantage. It's really important to keep this in mind if you're going to try growing carnivorous plants at home. Fortunately though, it can definitely be done and it's not even too difficult. You don't even need a greenhouse. This over here is a tropical pitcher plant that I have growing on my windowsill. All I need for it is a little bit of supplemental light in winter. 
And these are North American pitcher plants that are sitting outside of my backyard. They grow there all year round, and the only thing I do is water them and protect them at winter. This down here is a South American pitcher plant. This one's a bit more tricky and actually does require a greenhouse, so disregard that one for now. I'll be going over each of the commonly found genera of carnivorous plant in cultivation, starting with one of my favorites, Saracenia, also known as the North American pitcher plants. These plants have what's called a passive pitfall trap. The colorful structure you see here is not actually a flower. The real flower is this ugly green thing next to it. The structure here is actually the plant's modified leaves, which have curled around themselves, and you can see where the edges have fused along this midrib here. Around the edge of the tube, also known as the operculum, and on the underside of this big floppy lid, the plant secretes nectar, which attracts insects such as ants, wasps, moths, and flies. The edges of the tube are extremely slippery, and in some areas, such as the underside of the lid, even feature hairs that point downward. Any insect that lands in this area to try to drink some of that nectar is at a great risk of falling down into the tube where it will become stuck. The plant secretes digestive enzymes at the bottom of the tube to break down the insects and start incorporating some of the nutrients into the plant system. Actually, certain species produce a neurotoxin inside the nectar that impairs insects' motor capabilities and causes them to fall into the pitcher more easily. In other species, such as Saracenia purpurea, the digestion process is actually assisted by symbiotic communities of bacteria and other insects that live within the pitcher. You'll notice here that the lids are upright and actually allow rainwater to pool inside of the pitcher, where the plant's own microbiome aids in the digestion of prey. Saracenia are only found in North America, in the United States and Canada, where they range from the southeastern United States all the way up to western provinces of Canada. That being said, the places where the plants actually occur in this range are highly fragmented into specific areas of boggy habitat that are suitable for their growth, and I should also note that most of this northern part on the map is actually corresponding to only one species, Saracenia purpurea. As you might imagine, Saracenia purpurea is the most cold hardy of the Saracenia and is therefore a good candidate for growing in Pennsylvania. Growing Saracenia for the most part is pretty straightforward, but there are a couple of things that the plants absolutely will not compromise on. One of those things is light. The plant needs lots and lots of light and I'm talking about the sort of light that makes you squint really hard when you step outside. The plants want to be outside in full sun being blasted all afternoon long with full sun. Kind of like growing tomatoes, but carnivorous. The reason they need so much light is because the leaves are very inefficiently designed for photosynthesis compared to a broadleafed plant with flat leaves, for example, a maple tree. The tubular leaves of Saracenia are very poor at capturing light for photosynthesis, so they need a lot of it to compensate. In most cases, a windowsill will not have enough light for these plants. Uh, for that reason, Saracenia are pretty poor houseplants and are best kept outdoors. A second thing that Saracenia need a lot of is water. Uh, in the wild, the plants are mostly bog plants and they're found in areas that are permanently moist. If a Saracenia dries out, it will most likely die. During the growing season, I keep all of my plants sitting in water trays, which I periodically fill up to stop the soil from drying out. And Saracenia also do not like stagnant water. So it's a good idea to top water your plants frequently and occasionally let the trays dry out to renew the water pool. In terms of soil, the plants love acidic soil that can hold lots of water and is low in nutrients. The prime candidate for this is peat moss, which is what the plants actually grow in normally in the wild. You can buy big bales of peat moss as soil additives at Lowe's or Home Depot's for a pretty cheap price. And generally, the plants don't need to be repotted in peat moss too often. Um, usually, it'll only be every couple of years, by which time, if the plants have been growing well, they'll be big enough to divide and reproduce anyway. If you grow the plants for long enough, they might actually put out flowers for you, in which case you can try your own hand at hybridizing them. Um, Saracenia hybridization is a 
big pastime for carnivorous plant hobbyists. Um, I like to compare it to organ breeding sometimes with the amount of options and sizes and colors you can combine. And Saracenia hybrids are incredibly variable, so they're so fun to work with. Uh, for example, this on the left is Saracenia Leo Wilkerson. I've uh, put a golf ball in the picture to demonstrate the size. And on the right is one of its offspring, Saracenia Blood Moon by Leo Wilkerson. And you can see they really don't look anything alike. Of course, because Saracenia come from temperate regions, they have annual dormancy requirements that have to be respected. This picture up here is a couple of wild Saracenia purpurea growing in New Jersey that I visited back in December, and they're completely frozen solid. In cultivation, this is not ideal as repeated freeze-thaw cycles will rot the rhizomes and turn them into mush easily. Generally, in USDA zones 7 and colder, the plants need to be protected during winter. My favorite thing to do is to cut off all of the old pictures from the last season, um, with the exception of a couple of species that keep their pictures year after year, and then mulch the plants thickly with pine needles. Pine needles are a lot less susceptible to growing mold than other insulators like hay, and they tend to break down slowly, which makes them ideal for insulating these plants. Whenever I'm trimming my collection in the fall, I like to collect some of the nicest pictures from the autumn season and put them together in bouquets. They make really nice displays on the table for about a week. Unfortunately, the pictures aren't too long live once they're removed from the plant. Funny story though, I know some carnivorous plant hobbyists who have used Saracenia bouquets at their weddings instead of actual flowers. Once the weather starts warming back up and the day length increases again, uh, typically around April to May in Pennsylvania, the plants will begin waking up. At this point, it's pretty important to make sure that all the old dead growth is cleared away because the new pictures coming in for the year are going to need lots of sunlight. In fact, in the wild, this uh, the old vegetation is cleared away periodically by wildfires. Here's a wild Saracenia purpurea, also in New Jersey, and you can see a lot of the old pictures have been burned away by wildfire. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't address everyone's fan favorite, Dionea muscipula, or the Venus flytrap. Dionea is actually a monotypic genus, so there's only one species within the genus. However, there's tons and tons of cultivars of Venus flytraps that have been artificially bred over the years, and they come in lots of different sizes and shapes and colors. In the wild, Venus flytraps only grow in a specific radius, um, I think less than 70 miles, in North and South Carolina. And you can see on the legend here, on this map, that Venus flytraps are under increasing danger of extirpation in a lot of their locations. In fact, it recently became a federal crime to poach Venus flytraps. They mostly grow in the same type of habitat as Saracenia, and in fact, at a lot of their locations, they will be found growing alongside Saracenia and other carnivorous plants. For that reason, the techniques to growing Venus flytraps are pretty much identical to growing North American pitcher plants, so I won't go into too much detail about them here. In terms of trapping mechanism, the Venus flytrap has what is called a snap trap, which is only shared by one other species of carnivorous plant, which is actually an aquatic cousin of the Venus flytrap known as Aldrovanda. The plants have two opposing leaf lobes in each of their traps, and nectar is secreted along the edges. In the middle of the lobes, there, on each side, there are three trigger hairs that will cause the trap to spring shut if they're touched twice within 20 seconds. That mechanism makes sure that the trap isn't set off by things like debris or wind or rainwater. Once the electrochemical signal has been sent by the trigger hairs and the trap is shut around the insect, the trap will form a vacuum and begin secreting digestive enzymes into the pocket that will slowly digest the insides of the insect and allow the nutrient slush to be incorporated into the plant. It's pretty macabre, but I would be lying if I said that I wasn't completely fascinated with it. Moving on to the other side of the world, we have Nepenthes, or the tropical pitcher plants. These carnivorous plants inhabit the jungles of Southeast Asia, and like Saracenia, also feature a pitfall trap. However, Saracenia and Nepenthes are not closely related at all, so this was a carnivorous trait that evolved independently in both plant families. 
The traps operate in pretty much the same way that Saracenia traps do, except Nepenthes maintain a large pool of fluid at the bottom of the pitcher that Saracenia typically do not. Anatomically speaking, Saracenia and Nepenthes are pretty different too. In Saracenia, the pitchers are the main photosynthetic organ. In Nepenthes, the pitchers are usually not photosynthetic, and instead, you can see along the leaf midrib here, what look like leaves are actually modified photosynthetic organs that do all the plants photosynthesizing for it. There's around 200 different species of Nepenthes, so as you can imagine, the proper growing techniques are not the same across the board. That being said, we can broadly split Nepenthes into two main groups known as highlanders and lowlanders. Highlanders, like this Nepenthes jacqueliniae here, are usually found at altitudes above 1,000 meters, while lowlanders, like this Nepenthes alata from the Philippines, are found below 1,000 meters. Generally, the highlanders tend to be a bit more picky in their growth habits. They require mild days in around the 70 to 75 Fahrenheit range, going up to 80 in some cases, and a nighttime temperature drop to around 60 degrees Fahrenheit. For a lot of sensitive highlanders, if that nighttime drop in temperature is not achieved, the plants will slowly weaken and then die. Highlanders in general also require very high humidity. Um, many of them come from montane cloud forests that are constantly shrouded in fog, and they're typically pretty slow growing plants. Uh, some of the slower species might only put out three or four leaves and pitchers a year. By contrast, lowlanders tend to be a lot more quick growing. They prefer warmer temperatures, in some cases up to 100 Fahrenheit during the day. They like uh, very humid conditions, and they definitely do not require significant drop in temperature at night. Of course, because this is biology, these categories are not clear-cut at all in most cases. There are many species that straddle the line between highlander and lowlander, so it's always important to look up the demographic information of each individual species before you attempt to grow it. Although many Nepenthes, especially the highland species, can be pretty intimidating to grow and quite expensive, sometimes ranging into the thousands of dollars for a single dime-sized plant, there are plenty of species that are very friendly to beginner growers. A lot of these species tend to come from intermediate level elevations, such as this Nepenthes ventricosa, which occurs between 1,000 and 2,000 meters, and this Nepenthes zacriana, um, which occurs at 1,500 meters. A lot of these species tend to have thicker, uh, heftier leaves with more substantial waxy cuticles that are more tolerant of low humidity. A lot of these plants can be grown at home on a sunny south-facing windowsill provided they're given supplemental light during the winter. In fact, uh, sufficient light is the most critical factor to getting good pitcher production, not humidity. A lot of people have Nepenthes vines that produce long, lanky stems, but don't produce pitchers because they're not getting enough light. While humidity can be helpful for pitchering, it's not the critical factor, and you're much better off investing in some good artificial lights than you are in trying to spray the plants twice daily, because that will not do anything. Nepenthes like to be kept in well-draining and light soil, um, definitely much airier than the peat moss that Saracenia uh, prefer. A good mix for no most Nepenthes is sphagnum long-fibered moss, not the peat moss, the actual moss. If any of you grow orchids, you'll be really familiar with the stuff. And generally, growers like to mix it with uh, aerating materials like perlite. The media should be kept moist at all times, but never dry or soaking wet. Uh, Nepenthes roots are susceptible to rot. And in general, when repotting and changing media, uh, care should be taken to avoid disturbing the roots because Nepenthes hate having their root systems messed with. The roots are very thin um, and delicate, so they're very easy to break. In terms of temperature, the easier intermediate species, like the two featured on this slide, uh, don't have strong preferences. Room temperature all year is more than adequate for most of them. Another consideration if you're considering growing Nepenthes is that the plants are vines and they get big. And when I say big, I mean they can get six feet tall easily and longer. So make sure that you're prepared to have the room for those. A really fascinating part of that biology is that the plants produce two different kinds of pitchers depending on what, uh, life cycle, or what stage of the life cycle they're in. 
when the plants are young rosettes that haven't started vining yet, they produce uh, shorter, squatter, lower pitchers. And when the plants are in their vining stage, they produce these longer tendrils that like to wrap around surrounding vegetation that terminate in aerial pitchers or upper pitchers. There's a series of really interesting studies that look at the different types of prey and uh, items that are caught in each different type of pitcher. Generally, the aerial pitchers specialize more in flying insects, while the terrestrial lower pitchers specialize more in crawling insects. Nepenthes do flower, um, but they're rather tricky to grow from seed, and the plants are male and female, and it's quite difficult to get a breeding pair of Nepenthes to flower at the same time. So typically, that's a reproduction technique left up to the experts. However, Nepenthes are also pretty easy to propagate by cuttings. Long growing tips of vines can be removed and placed in soil, and within a few months, they should sprout new roots and produce a new plant that's genetically identical to the parent. If you have a sunny windowsill at home and mild temperatures, I would definitely suggest giving some of the easier Nepenthes species a try. Now on to one of my absolute favorites, known as Drosera, or the sundews. It's not too difficult to see how they got the name. When the morning light hits them in just the right angle, the plants glisten like they're covered in morning dew. The plants are not actually covered in dew though. Um, what you see here is a sticky mucilage produced by the plant to trap insects. Insects are lured in by the plant's colorful appearance and the seeming abundance of nectar, which is actually a deadly bioglue, and become trapped on the plant's leaves. Once they're trapped, most species have the ability to begin slowly curling their leaves over the course of several hours or several seconds in a couple of them to wrap the insect within the leaf where then the plant will begin secreting digestive enzymes to break down the insect's body. It's hard to see in this photo, but there's a small insect trapped on this leaf and you can see the leaf is curling to bend around it. Drosera are native to areas all around the world and are found in incredibly diverse habitats and they range in size from the size of a small dime to almost two feet tall. Taking a look at the range map over here, we can see that there are quite a lot of species that fall within the tropical and subtropical areas of the world. Um, most of the range of these more northern populations is actually only covered by a handful of species. Temperate Drosera can be grown just like Saracenia for the most part, um, but I'm going to be focusing my discussion on the tropical and subtropical species, which are far more abundant and more common in cultivation. This beautiful plant is known as Drosera capensis from South Africa. And you can see that I've made a very bold statement at the bottom of the slide here. I think it's the best carnivorous plant. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, this plant is nothing short of amazing. You can step on it, you can burn it, you can let it dry out to some degree, you can completely ignore it and it will survive and it will grow and in some cases it will thrive. I'm speaking from personal experience in a lot of those cases. This is the perfect and go-to species for a new beginner grower of carnivorous plants. It's incredibly fast growing, it's forgiving, and it's very prolific. So if you want to try growing carnivorous plants from seed for your first time, Drosser capensis seeds are the way to go. Drosser capensis thrives in conditions that subtropical sundews prefer. Generally, the plants will like daytime temperatures of around 70 to 80 Fahrenheit. And some of the pickier species, especially highland species from South America, will prefer nighttime drops in temperature, but Drosser capensis does not care. In terms of soil, I'm pretty sure Drosser capensis could gr grow on a wet sock if you wanted it to, but other sundew species like acidic, wet soil like Saracenia. Most subtropical sundews can be grown in varying combinations of peat moss, perlite, and sand. The plants should be kept moist all the time. In the wild, they occur near streams, bogs, rivers, any area that is permanently wet or moist. And like Saracenia, the plants tend to dislike stagnant water. So the water should be renewed and the plants should be top watered periodically. In terms of light, Drosera are like most other carnivorous plants. They need lots of light and they love as much light as you can possibly give them. Most subtropical and tropical Drosera don't have seasonal dormancy requirements, with the exception of a couple. So they can be grown indoors all year under lights or at a bright windowsill if you so choose. Under strong lights, a lot of species, like this Drosera capensis over here, will flush a beautiful red color. 
You can generally gauge how happy a sundew is by how much dew it's producing. So on this plant on the right, which is getting plenty of light and water, you can see that it's making copious mucous globules and that the plant is absolutely coated in the stuff. In plants that are not getting enough light, the, the leaves will be splindly, green, droopy, and they won't be producing dew. Higher humidity may be helpful for growing these plants, but it's by no means a strict requirement and in most cases can actually be a detriment because it'll cause mold to grow on the leaves if there's no, not sufficient airflow. The plants can also be reproduced by leaf cuttings. All you need to do is snip off a portion of the section with the tentacles over here, sit it in clean water, and put it under lights, and little plantlets that are genetically identical to the parent will sprout within a couple of weeks. Morphologically speaking, Drosera are incredibly diverse. On the left here is Drosera prolifera from Queensland, Australia, and it produces these kidney-shaped leaves on long stalks. On the right is Drosera admirabilis from South Africa, and it produces these long, plump rosettes of flat leaves that almost look like little pancakes. I always like to appreciate how the plants actually grow in the wild before I try replicating that in my own collection. On the left are some of my Drosera filiformis. Um, actually, these plants are descended from parents in Ocean County, New Jersey. On the right, we can see wild Drosera filiformis growing in these vast fields in New Jersey. It's an absolutely incredible sight. Um, these plants are growing at the edge of a wet, sandy seepage uh, le leading to a stream. And the ground is absolutely covered in sundews. It's really amazing. Now on to Pinguicula, or butterworts. Um, when translated from Latin, the genus name actually means little greasy one, which I thought is pretty interesting. Pinguicula are like sundews in that they use a flypaper trap with sticky mucus that traps insects. However, pinguicula tend to go after much smaller prey than sundews. So most ping pinguicula will be only be able to trap insects like little gnats or springtails in the soil. Like sundews, pinguicula have a pretty wide range globally. But also like sundews, most of the northern range here, um, spanning Europe and Canada, is actually only comprised of a couple of species. The center of pinguicula diversity is here in Latin America, uh, from Mexico down to Peru. Mexican pinguicula in particular tend to be the most common and easy in cultivation, so I'll be focusing my discussion on those primarily. In the wild, Mexican pinguicula are often found growing in rocky outcroppings and, in some cases, even on cliff edges. In cultivation, this reflects any preference for mineral-based inorganic mixes, including limestone, uh, calcites, a small amount of peat moss, perlite, vermiculite, etc. Or you can also grow them on rocks, like I prefer to do. These two plants are growing on a piece of volcanic rock known as scoria. It's filled with... Uh, air holes that allow for water that I keep in a dish at the bottom of the rock to wick upwards towards the plant's roots. You can also easily grow a large number of Mexican pinguicula on rocks like pumice. In terms of light, temperature, and water requirements, Mexican pinguicula are very similar to many subtropical drosera, so they'll want strong light all year, mild temperatures, and a good amount of clean water. However, Mexican pinguicula all also have seasonal adaptational quirks that most subtropical drosera do not. Mexican pinguicula actually occur in summer and winter forms. The summer forms are formed by thick bundles of succulent leaves that are actually not carnivorous, so the leaves at this point stop producing mucus. At this point, the plants retreat into this thick rosette in an attempt to save water. This is an adaptation to the hot and dry summers found in a lot of the places where Mexican pinguicula grow. During these times, the plants should be kept uh, much more dry than they're normally kept during the growing season, otherwise the rosettes have a chance of rotting. On the right is a pinguicula gypsicola that is just beginning to emerge into its winter growing phase. The plants are in active growth during this time of the year and they produce leaves that are loaded with mucus and ready to trap insects. 
The plants can be kept damp and too moist at this point in time and should be kept away from temperatures that are exceedingly hot. Pinguicula gypsicola in particular is one of my absolute favorite pinguicula species. I always thought the plants looked like little inverted octopi. It's also quite unusual because most Mexican pinguicula just have long, broad, and flat leaves. Here's another interesting species uh, known as Pinguicula calderoniae, and on the left we can see the summer rusting rosettes, and on the right we can see the plants in full growth in winter. The switch from winter to summer mode and back and forth seems to be regulated mostly by the length of daylight and not by temperatures. So as long as your plants are on a natural photo cycle, they should be able to switch between the forms around the year with no problem. And now on to Utricularia, also known as the bladderworts. This is the largest genus of carnivorous plants, comprising well over 200 species, and the genus of carnivorous plants with the widest distribution. I mean, just look at the map. These things are like weeds. They're everywhere, except for West Africa and the Arabian Peninsula, apparently. Utricularia actually have suction traps. Um, that's where the namesake bladderwort comes from. The plants produce these little bladder-shaped uh, contraptions underground which they vacuum seal by pumping out all of the water from inside. The traps have little trap doors in the front that are lined with trigger hairs. Small passing insects underground or underwater that hit these trigger hairs cause the trap door to swing open, therefore sucking the insect inside of the depressurized trap where they will be digested by the plant. Most growers don't actually grow Utricularia for the traps though, because one, they're underground or underwater, and two, they're really small for the most part and hard to see. I also couldn't get any good photos of them, unfortunately, because I didn't have my microscope on me. But most people don't grow Utricularia for the traps, they grow them for the flowers. Most species produce stunning displays of flowers. Um, each individual flower, depending on the species, can range in size from a small thimble to the size of a softball. This beautiful display of tiny flowers over here is made by Utricularia blanchettii from Brazil. And the flowers almost remind me of little orchids suspended on delicate strings. The flowers are incredibly diverse across the genus. This is Utricularia asplundii from Latin America, and it's a member of a section of Utricularia known as the Orchioides. They're named that because of their flowers' resemblance to orchids. Members of this section tend to have very large and showy flowers, but unfortunately they also tend to be a little bit more difficult to grow. They usually come from higher elevation rainforests and mountaintops in South America, and therefore have temperature requirements simpler, similar to that of highland nepenthes. On the other hand, there's plenty of terrestrial utricularia, like this utricularia warburgii from China, that have much more standard carnivorous plant requirements, and they can be grown just like subtropical Drosera. There's also plenty of aquatic Utricularia, such as Utricularia inflata. These plants produce long trailing systems of traps and bladders underneath the water surface, and once a year in the spring produce these modified floats that actually sprout flowers out of the top. The aquatic Utricularia tend to be a bit more tricky to keep long term in cultivation. Some of them require very specific water chemistry and regular water movement to stay alive, so I would recommend staying away from the aquatic ones in the beginning. Now, there are many other genera of carnivorous plants that I did not cover, mostly because they tend to be A, very uncommon, B, very hard to keep alive in cultivation, or C, a combination of the above two. Two of the more common genera that I didn't mention that are in cultivation include Cephalotus, um, also known as the Albany pitcher plant from Southwest Australia, and Heliamphor, also known as sun pitcher plants, which come from the Tepui Mountains of Venezuela. Cephalotus tend to be pretty picky about temperature, humidity, um, seasonal resting requirements, and the soil composition. So that's a plant best left to growers who have had a couple of years experience growing some other carnivorous plants. Heliamphora are much the same way. They come from the very famous tabletop mountains of northern South America, 
at elevations well above 1500 meters. And they're especially tricky because they have light requirements that are the same as Saracenia, to which they are closely related, but they also have temperature requirements that are more like Highland Nepenthes. As you can imagine, it's really difficult to give a plant a ton of light without raising the temperature too much. So helium for are best managed for those growers who have specialized setups, like Highland greenhouses. Helium for are also incredibly slow growing. They only put out a couple pictures per year, but I also think they're incredibly rewarding. They're just incredibly beautiful plants. This one down here is my favorite, Heliamphora ionisi. The pictures to me look like beautifully sculpted vases. So that's the end of my talk today. I'm just going to end by mentioning my book. If you were intrigued by any of those habitat shots of Drosera I showed in the wild before, there's plenty more where that came from in my book that I published last year. This is a comprehensive national history monograph covering the habitats, ecology, history, and growth habits of all of the Drosera that are native to New Jersey. If you're interested, you can check it out on the Botanical Research Institute of Texas Press's website. Once again, thank you to Cooper Siegel for having me, and I hope I'll see some of you growing carnivorous plants in the near future.